Hey all, this is the um, class, the video, the voice thread video for um, the class on post-impressionism. Um, and I'm going to start with, uh, with this piece, even though this is not anything you guys read about. Um, but I, I'm going to use this piece as a way to introduce um, post-impressionism. So we talked last time about um, all of these impressionist artists who really changed the way um, people were making art. Um, instead of conceiving of the world as trying to imitate what they were seeing around them, they started working in a way um, that took into account the space between themselves and the object, the atmosphere, the light, the water in the air. Uh, they wanted to, to, to break up that the objects that they were seeing, those short little brush strokes, had to do with that, that idea of light and atmosphere dancing around on the surface of those objects. And they tended to amp up their colors. Um, they were accused of being all too beautiful, all that. So a little review on Impressionism. Very quickly after the Impressionists <coughs> got underway, excuse me, um, there were other artists that came along and said, eh, Impressionism is too vague. It doesn't have, they don't, they don't really, aren't, they aren't really doing, um, they aren't doing it right. They're not painting right. Uh, they need to be, instead of um, their impression of, what, the, of what, what is out there, they need to think of um, the art and their painting in a more scientific way some people and some other people felt that they should do it in a way that is more emotional or everybody had different reactions and that's why this next group of artists that we're going to be talking about are called the post impressionists because what they have in common is that they were reacting to impressionism so they took what the impressionists did and they kind of reacted against it but without the impressionists these guys wouldn't have had anything they wouldn't have had a place to start so the impressionists were really important in getting things started Started. You're looking at a really famous painting. It's a very large painting, um, about 10 feet long by almost seven feet tall. It's by an artist named Georges Seurat. It's called A Sunday Afternoon on the Island of the Grand Chatte. And um, it is a piece uh, that is done in the technique called pointillism. And if you look carefully at the, at the painting, you'll see that um, that that it is made up of all these little dots of paint and it's a you know favorite um, art class painting technique etc um, and Seurat believed that the Impressionists, although they were good at color, they got the whole color thing wrong. And he felt that color should be done in a scientific way. Um, and that the eye could optically blend pure p dots of color if they were placed close together. So um, I'll kind of move us forward. If you go in a little bit closer and look at the, at the dots a little bit clearer, you can see that the greens um, on the grass, for instance, or the greens of the tree are made up of blues and yellows and a variety of blended other blended colors uh, that that combine optically to, to create that that field of green um, that make up the grass or the trees um, and so in this way he was he was viewing the painting the color and these pointillist dots um, as being very very scientific uh, and his attitude I think is also easy to see in his composition notice how even though even though uh, this is supposed to be people in a park, they don't look very animated. They don't look much like people. They look a lot more like um, poles and horizontal lines and vertical lines. Um, so they don't have very much um, motion. They don't have very much um, emotion. Uh, they almost actually read like a grid. Um, so that's that was interesting, um, Georges uh, Seurat's uh, reaction. Here's a couple more Seurat. All right, and the, the next person that we're gonna study who is probably the most famous post-impressionist is um, Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, Van Gogh was a really interesting man, a complex man who lived in this time in the late 1800s. Um, he, he, was, uh, the, he was Dutch. He was the oldest son of a Protestant minister. He wanted to be a minister also. Uh, he worked amongst the poor in his area in North, in Holland as a lay preacher so not a so a um, like a somebody who was not a sanctioned ordained that's the word ordained predestor minister um, and he he worked with them but uh, he now I'll show you another this is an early one of his drawings 
And this is a very, very early painting called The Potato Eaters. And it was painted of those um, people that he was working with as a lay, uh, as a lay minister. Um, he, he, his early Dutch paintings, um, like the kind of realist work of Daumier, was about the simple pe peasants. He painted in a very dark and somber palette, a little bit like, um, uh, like Daumier, a little bit like a Courbet. Um, and and his, this was very early in his career, before he'd been exposed to Paris and what was going on with the Impressionists there. Um, it's interesting to note uh, that they're, they're full of pathos. You know, he, you can see how much he cares about these people and how, how much he feels for them and their plight. Here they are, this, uh, this tight little family of very poor, probably coal miners working there in, um, in Holland. And all, all they can have for dinner is uh, a bunch of potatoes that they've, they're cutting up into small pieces so they can each have enough. And, and the dark brew, which looks like maybe coffee that they're sharing amongst the five of them. Um, and although they don't have much and that they live in this dark, sad little house, you can see that he circles them up and, and lit, lights their interior space to kind of give the sense of that they're a tight-knit, close family unit, which is something he really admired about these people. Um, unfortunately, um, he uh, did not make it, or maybe fortunately, because he was a really good painter, but unfortunately, he didn't make it as a lay minister, um, even though he had he had a much compassion for them. The people found him to be too intense, very scary. He was an intense human being. Um, and, um, you, and you can almost see the awkwardness with which you can imagine him paint in that room with them. Um, and that's, that, that's also something that is, um, uh, you know, I think communicates in this, in this painting. So after failing at this being a, being a preacher, um, he decided to full turn full time to painting, um, and it was a it was in 1880, and he was 27 years old. He had decided to attend the Art Academy of Brussels, Belgium, um, but he soon felt. Uh, felt constrained by the rigid academic instruction, which didn't allow for the use of color, which was what he really, really wanted to, to work with was color. Um, for two years, he studied for two years, and, and uh, by then uh, he, was, he, had, he was fed up with the education and he quit. Now, interestingly, his brother, Theo, was an art dealer, a modern art dealer in Paris. And he went to see Theo, and while he was in, in Paris visiting Theo, he was exposed to the Impressionists. Now, take a look at this painting, which is one of his early, early ones after his time in Paris. Wow, what a difference, right? Um, so he, so here he was this seeing the work of the impressionist was like a revelation to him. He realized, oh my gosh, I don't have to paint these stark, somber colors that are very sad. I I can just go outside and react to to the world around me the way the impressionist did. Um, so he was very influenced by them, and also he was he was in communications with a other couple of the post impressionists like Gauguin, and he and Gauguin had a, a, a long-term um, kind of relationship um, as artists talking back and forth to one another about their work by, um, by, via mail. And so, so they didn't know each other, but they, they communicated with one another. And one of the things that they agreed upon was that the Impressionists, although they had a lot of things right, like good color, um, they had some other things wrong. Like they felt that both, both of them felt that the Impressionist work was too, um, uh, too shallow. It didn't have enough depth to it. And he, he, he felt that their style was too restrictive and he wanted his, his style to express more emotion. And what he felt was important in painting was, was emotion. Um, so, uh, so he decided to turn to, um, he wanted to give, turn to nature to be this kind of vehicle for expressing emotion. So let's take a look at this. Um, and I want you to think about it. Although this thing, this painting doesn't really express emotion in and of itself in terms of the ways that we're used to seeing emotion, like um, the way the body language is, or the way the, the um, expression of the face is, we can see that um, he's using color in this uh, very, very strong way. Uh, he's, he's taking um, a scene that me, might be out in front of you and amping up the color. And I want you to notice the kinds of colors he's using. 
Notice how it's a, a strip of, of the kind of golds followed by a strip of almost purpley grays and then the offset by these dark greens and then another strip of the, of the kind of purples and then the yellows. Purples and yellows, greens and reds, He's using a lot of contrasting colors. These are the complements, and, and they set up for a very exciting color relationship. So it looks bright and vibrant and really active. Um, and, and that's what he wants you to, to look at. He wants your eye to go zigzagging back in space on these horizontal lines, just really enjoying these color relationships. Um, and and he, I think the point of a painting like this is to bring you great joy. Um, notice how he, especially in the foreground, really allows the brushwork to be very, very active and, and how it just leads your eye right into the, into the painting. And he calms it down a bit as he gets back into, into space, uh, but, he's, but he still keeps the color pretty vibrant. Notice he also uses a lot of outlining. And uh, we saw the outlining first in, done with the realists like Courbet and then Manet. And um, the uh, Impressionists kind of gave up the outlining, but, but uh, Van Gogh, who was very into the Japanese prints, again, this flat, flat areas of outlined color, um, brings back the outlining. Let's look at a few other um, Van Goghs. This is the cypress trees. Why do you think he's painting here? You don't need to answer this on the voice thread, but look at what, look at this, look at what he's painting. What, I mean, notice again, look at the brushwork. Look at the sky. Have you ever seen anything like that? Right? It is a really active sky. And it's all about not just what he sees in front of him, but it's all about what he feels. You can really feel that warm wind blowing through the trees, blowing in the sky, blowing across the uh, fields. So awesome. He also did, uh, he also did a lot of, um, uh, he did portraits, he did um, uh, still lifes. This is a still life with, uh, with sunflowers. And um, and let's see, very next is his most famous one. Yeah, and his most famous one, which is the Starry Night. And this, the Starry Night is, um, I'm, I've got a few um, images of the Starry Night. I'll, I'll bring it. And the, the, real, the real piece, which is, this is the AP piece, doesn't look quite this blue, but nor is it quite this dull. So it's somewhere in between. So I'm sorry, I don't have a great slide for it. All right, so this is where I'm gonna stop and ask the first um, voice, thread, uh, voice thread question. Um, so first, let's give, let's give a little bit of background. Um, the Starry Night was painted uh, in 1889. It's an oil on canvas um, that is 29 by 36 inches. It's not that um, huge. But, you know, 36, that's three feet, so it's not small either. Um, he really had turned to a ex super expressive style. His brushwork is so much more um, visible than even any Impressionist um, a, a painting was. And it wasn't about recording surface texture. It wasn't about recording the atmosphere in the sky or the way the light danced on things. He's inventing all of this. This is brushwork that doesn't show what's out there. What does it show? I mean, yeah, it's a scene he was seeing, but it's not about the scene. The scene is the reason to paint it. It's the excuse, it's the subject, but it's not what the real subject is. So here's the question. What is the real subject of the Starry Night? What was Van Gogh trying to express with the brushwork, the color, the composition, and how was he doing that? Okay, so I, my, I, you guys take a moment to, you can pause the uh, video and, ex and write your answers down, or, or you can record them if you want on VoiceThread. Um, yeah, he says that he wasn't trying to do anything but express, be true to the treat scene in front of him, but I don't actually um, buy that. 
So I want, as you're thinking about this too, I want you to think about what would be the difficulty of painting um, a scene like this? It's at night, right? How much can you see at night? You'll notice his point of view is up high. Look at how we're looking down into the valley. Where, where the cypress tree that's in the foreground is clearly up closer to where he is viewing it. And this was said to have been painted outside of his, um, his window. And it was at a time when he was, we know in fact that he was in a, um, a kind of a mental health um, center. And he had, had suffered from a, um, from a very a tough um, break. They, he was. He had psychological, um, emotional distress, and there was a lot of people who believed that he was probably bipolar because he he had manic and depressive moments. Um, the painting, the Starry Night over the Rhone, was another one that he had done before the Starry Night outdoors and he used a gas lamp to um, illuminate his canvas. From this one it's hard to know exactly where he was but it said that he painted it from, um, in, 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 from his window. Um, he was, uh, 1989 was a critical year for him. Um, not only did he produce an amazing number of canvases but he started having these breaks with reality he was painting um, in southern France at the time, in Arles, um, but he was unable to get along with Gauguin, who had come down to join him and, uh, and paint with him. They were um, fighting a lot. Um, they had different beliefs about what the painting, sh painting should do. They had similar, they have things that relate their styles, but they were very, they were definitely uh, didn't, had different points of view. And uh, Gauguin, uh, they, and Gauguin uh, Van Gogh threatened Gauguin with a razor at one point, and that was it for Gauguin. He was like, okay, I'm out. And he, he escaped and left Arles. And following this, uh, Vincent cut off his earlobe in that famous um, incident and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then sent it to a woman who had rejected him earlier. Um, following this um, catastrophic series of events, uh, his brother Theo um, hospitalized him in this, uh, um, this asylum, this mental health hospital in Sarami for the mentally ill. And he was encouraged to paint there. And he did, although he didn't go far, um, uh, far from there. Um, so many claim that he painted it from the hospital window, as I said, just said, um, but apparently not. Apparently he was just outside on the hospital grounds looking down. And he probably composed it from a series of sketches that he pieced together, um, also from his imagination. Um, so exactly um, the way he did not want to do it originally, which is to, com to, to kind of compose this within his own mind. Um, so he, he, uh, he said he was influenced by ancient woodcuts. Um, and that's why he was talking about that's why he, not sorry, that's why he did this very, very uh, strong linear style with these very obvious brushstroke strokes because he wanted it to look like a woodcut. So it's interesting. And it does look like a woodcut. And I can see that influence. But hopefully by now you've answered the question, what was he trying to express? And I think it's, it's not okay to say that he was trying to express his mental illness because of course he wouldn't have viewed it that way. And, and I don't think any of us can judge what his mental illness was and how it might've influenced him. I'd like for you to answer the question based on what you see and what you think he might've been trying to express in, in terms of um, his own point of view and his own emotional, um, his own emotions about this. Cause I don't think this is a, um, particularly sad painting, which is, which is interesting. Okay, so let's move us forward. All right, this is a painting um, that Gauguin painted of that time. This is a self-portrait of, or no, sorry, this is a portrait of Van Gogh that Gauguin painted. So this is Vincent painting his sunflowers and painted by Van Gogh. This is a, a self-portrait that Vincent made after the whole ear incident. Um, he, he did, Vincent van Gogh made many, many uh, self-portraits uh, and, and they were all um, pretty introspective. 
And this one definitely, uh, again, uses the very rough brushwork. Um, and he's, and he, he also puts a skin tone that's kind of green on his face, which makes him look a little bit sad, a little bit sick. And he leaves a, this bandaged ear very obvious. He wants the viewer to see it. Um, but one of the things I want you to notice is what he's got hanging behind his head. And that is his interpretation of a da Japanese print, which he had hanging in his um, residence. This is a painting of downtown Arles. Again, look at those contrasting colors, really expressing so much joy, really. But it makes you wonder about him, you know, was he part of that joy? Look at this cafe scene, all these people in that bright warm light, people walking down the cobblestone street, the stars in the sky. But look at where Vincent is. He's kind of separate. He's, he's where we are. We're kind of separate. This is his room in the, in the uh, mental institution. And, and it's interesting because it also looks pretty homey, right? Notice his, the brother, his painting of himself and his brother hanging on the wall and this, you know, kind of cozy environment. This is a, a, a Japanese print which he owned and he also painted a version of. Just in case you were wondering how much influence the Japanese prints on him had, had on him very much. And I think this is a great painting and a great print because you can see that all that, those elements of Japanese prints, which he loved, which is the cropping, the flatness, the outlining, the graphic, strong graphic um, quality of them, and, and that really different point of view. Okay, now we're gonna move on to um, Paul Gauguin. Um, and so Gauguin was the, the other post-impressionist that we're, we're gonna talk about. Uh, well, not, we've got another one too. Um, Gauguin, um, was a, a French, uh, he's an interesting guy. He, he's French also, oh not, I'm sorry, uh, Vincent was, um, was Dutch, Gauguin is French. Um, he was also super interesting, not quite as interesting as, as Vincent actually. Um, but uh, unlike almost all the painters we've studied uh, in the, this recent time, uh, he did not begin his life as a painter. He was actually a successful stockbroker um, and he was an amateur painter on the side. At age 35, um, he decided to abandon his, uh, his conventional life. Um, he, he stopped being a stockbroker. Um, he left his wife and children. Um, he just abandoned everything. And he decided to devote himself 100% fully um, to painting. He became a central figure in a new movement called symbolism. Um, and one of his beliefs was that modern society had forced men down a road towards material gain that, that kind of caused them to abandon their emotional life. So he wanted to reconnect with his emotional life. And he believed that color and emotion were strongly connected. So his use of color is always very tied to emotions. Very similar to... to um, uh, Vincent van Gogh, although I'd say that van Gauguin's idea about emotion and color was much more calculated. It was much more prescribed. It was, he thought red was about this emotion and green was about that emotion versus um, van, van Gogh who painted straight out of, from his heart into what he felt was the right response for the moment. So he left Paris and went to the countryside in Brittany, um, which is um, an area of France, where he was struck by the strong influence the church still had on the local people. He was very, very drawn to their simple and seemingly pure lifestyle. Um, and this one is called, uh, this one is from that early time there in Brittany. And you can see the hats that the women are wearing was, uh, was kind of um, the style of the women in that time frame. Um, and it was definitely old fashioned even for that, uh, for that time that he was painting in. Um, so this is a local uh, style. And here we have um, these local ladies all wearing their little white caps and dark dresses and they're all praying. And this is called The Vision After the Sermon painted in 1888. Um, and so one of the first things you might notice about this is the fact that um, that that they seem to be the women on the on the left side. So let's look, let's use my cursor, my mouse to show that the women 
are separated from this event that's happening up in the upper right side of the painting by this big tree that just kind of cuts the whole canvas in half a uh, diagonal. And so these guys are in the in a space that is more like our space, you know, the, the viewer's space. And over here we have an angel um, wrestling with um, with the um, it's with Jacob, I think. It's Jacob wrestling the angel. So um, the angel is trying to get Jacob to do God's will, and Jacob is refusing, and so the angel is, is wrestling him. And so, of course, the women are praying because they're having this vision together, this collective vision, according to Gauguin's imagination of this. But what, what they're really viewing is Gauguin wrestling with himself. And so this is a, this is a nice... Um, way for him to think about probably what he was dealing with, which was abandoning his old, old life and starting out this new, uh, what he felt was a calling into painting. Um, so this is a very unreal space. And he was one of the first painters to completely uh, abandon what we might call Renaissance sense of receding space in favor of, um, uh, of the sensibilities that might even be more Gothic which is kind of interesting. And so he's, and, and you'll also notice that the, his use of color, this red background, also abandons the outside reality, doesn't care that the grass is green, and he wants it to be red, and so there it is. Um, and he wanted it to approach painting with the same kind of childlike na naivete that he felt these people possessed. So he was trying to emulate them in some way, um, which is interesting. Okay, let's look at another early painting. This is an um, this is a self portrait uh, of him. So this this is himself, and you can see that he's putting himself in this position of almost being like the Adam being tempted. You can see the apples. You can see the halo over his head. You can see the snake, and you can also see these lilies. Of course, lilies are are symbols of purity, and he looks anything but pure. And if he's trying to decide, am I going to make the choice towards purity or the sin of knowledge. He's got the snake in his hand. You just know what that choice is going to be. Eventually, he decided he needed to find an even more pure society, and he left um, France, and he, uh, and he traveled all the way to Tahiti in the South Pacific uh, to, to live. He basically lived almost the rest of his life um, in, in Tahiti. And because uh, he felt that he would find a pure, untouched culture there. But of course, that wasn't true either. Um, the people there had already been very much Western, Westernized. So a lot of what we, you'll see in his Tahiti paintings were also made up. Um, they were things that he imagined might be true about the people. Um, which is very, very interesting. So Gauguin, struggling with his own identity, runs further away from the society he grew up in to find a purer society. Um, and, uh, and, and that is where he lands, and he stays most of the rest of his life, and he eventually dies there on the island. He comes back over the course of the next um, several years, I think twice to France. He has two pretty successful shows, um, but he doesn't make much money selling his canvases, and so he's always scrapping uh, to, you know, live there on the island. Um, interestingly, he, uh, he, in that pure lifestyle, um, he dies of syphilis in that life, in that, in that, on that island, um, which is which is kind of interesting. And and he's been widely criticized um, now in, in present day um, for the fact that when he went to Tahiti, he end, ended up taking a very young wife. This is a portrait of his wife, who I think I mean he was in his 30s by then, um, you know what almost 40, and she was probably a teenager, maybe probably under 18. She was very young. Um, so he's been widely criticized for, um, for you know, not living a very good life in terms of um, being respectful of the people that he was living with. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this one really quickly, because um, this one is an early, uh, early painting that he did there on Tahiti. It's called We Hail Thee Mary, or La Orana Maria. Maria. It was painted in 1891. Um, and as you can see, it's a Mary and... Jesus done kind of Tahitian style. Um, Jesus 
baby is a little bit bigger, sitting on Mary's shoulder, being um, followed by her, you know, entourage. And you can see kind of hidden in the jungly um, bushes next to these two, uh, an angel who is kind of a vision. And you can also see the local um, fruits, the, you know, that, that fruitful, um, you know, the, the strong um, symbols of, the, of that island. Um, one of the other things that he was getting more and more uh, into was this very strong, flat shapes, very strong, flat areas of color, um, which were, really became characteristic of his later style. Um, and actually, this, um, this was a style called croissantism, or this flat color surrounded by heavier line or outline, um, which was a, a way to very obviously not try to reproduce the world around us. Uh, but to, to signal to the viewer that this was um, this was a canvas that was flat and not an, an interpretation of the outside world, which is not flat. Okay, we'll skip past this. All right, this is the piece that's um, on the AP. Um, it is, in his estimation, his most important piece, and it's a huge, huge piece. Um, it is 139 uh, centimeter, no, sorry, 374 centimeters wide by 139 tall. Um, it's very, very, very big. Uh, and it's actually uh, at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, since Boston owns this painting, um, which is interesting. Um, okay. Oh. So, um, this is this is one of his latest late works, the one of the ones that he made um, before his death, um, and it explores the timeless question of our purpose on Earth. Um, this was by far his largest canvas ever, um, and it is meant to be read from right to left, and uh, which, which is kind of interesting. And you can also see that there are these two kind of interesting kind of gold areas on either side, which is meant to almost make it look like a scroll. Like these are the ra ragged edges of a scroll, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, so it is meant to read from, from right to left. And you can see, I think if you look at it pretty, it, it doesn't take much, uh, doesn't take much effort um, to look at it, uh, to see that it's a, it's a progression from the baby that's here to the old lady that's over here. So going right to left, it's the life cycle. Um, but there's a great deal of, um, of personal symbolism here in this, um, in this painting. Um, so I want you to, uh, so there, there's quite a lot. You guys have read, um, uh, you looked at Khan Academy and you read uh, Khan, Khan Academy and you read in the book. Um, so this is a really good place, I think, to pause. And I want you to um, uh, talk to me on VoiceThread about this painting. What do you think uh, Gauguin was trying to say about this painting? Um, yes, it's a life cycle. It's birth, life, and death. But what was his attitude about it? What was his attitude about, um, about, the, about life? Um, and, and how does he tell us that attitude in this painting? Um, how does he express his attitude? Was it positive attitude? Was it negative attitude? Um, was it, was it you know, I want you to tell me about it. Um, so tell me what he was trying to say about our cycle of life. Um, and, and, use ex and use a piece of evidence or some evidence in this canvas to explain your meaning. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in this canvas that we don't even know what the symbolism is because it was so personal, but, but there's plenty of other symbolism I think that is very um, easy to understand. Um, and so I want you to pick, pick out some of the piece, the significant pieces and, and, and talk about, about what Gauguin is trying um, to get. Um, from this. And I also want you to, um, to, to think a little bit about why he uses such a variety in the scale. Notice how the scale kind of pushes and pulls you back and forth. He doesn't care about space. He doesn't care about scale. How is he using scale, actually? Um, so let's take a quick look before. This is uh, one of his preliminary um, drawings of it and and he said in his uh, the quote you read in the book that he didn't make a preliminary drawing but that's not true 
um, that also has to go to, to his own personal narrative and his own thought about what he was like as a, as a painter, um, which wasn't exactly true. Um, and here's some more close-ups of, of the painting. Okay. So, pause now, answer that question, and then I'm going to take us to our very last piece. Oh no, we've got one more after this. Two more pieces. Okay, this one um, is pretty fun. Uh, and this is not, uh, Munch is not considered a post-impressionist. Um, so, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to stop and we're going to talk about it because it's ne next on the slideshow. Um, and even though he was considered more of an expressionist than a post-impressionist, um, he, so you can see his work maybe relates more to uh, like next generation after Vincent van Gogh. And um, I think that would be an accurate assessment. Um, but he, he uh, in fact, wasn't a post-impressionist. Um, this painting is called, it's very famous, you've probably seen it, it's called The Screen. It was, um, it was created in 1893 and actually he made more than one version of it. I can show you another version. He even made a, a block print version of it. So he made several versions of it. And we're going to talk about this one, which is his most famous one. Munch was a Norwegian painter who suffered a great deal of tragedy as a child. Both his mother and his sister wasted away and eventually died of tuberculosis. Um, and he also nearly died of tuberculosis as a teen, but he recovered, although he lost both of them. Expressionism was kind of a natural style for him to turn to, um, but, but his bluntly frank paintings and dealing with the themes of death and sexuality were very shocking to the general viewing public um, and the critics. Um, he was invited to show in a salon for the group called The Succession, um, which was a kind of a neat, was a kind of an expressionist group, but his pin paintings were considered so outrageous that they actually closed the entire show, um, which is kind of interesting. The Scream was originally conceived by him as a part of an autobiographical series of works called The Freeze of Life, not the freeze like cold, but the freeze um, that one would have on a Greek temple. Um, he, uh, he actually created four color versions, two in paint, two in pastel, um, and one painting uh, done on cardboard sold in 2012 for $120 million. Yep. And he also made the lithograph a little bit later on. Um, and he was experimenting with the effects of different media to see well, what, what, which one worked best. Um, so I, I, I think, Again, we're, I, I want you to, to take a minute at this point, I'm going to, before I go in, I'm not going to describe it. I think you guys can look at it and you're pretty darn good at, at describing paintings and what you see. So I want to take you to stop now and on VoiceThread, I want you to record um, what you see exactly. I want you to think, uh, I mean, not just the man and the bridge, etc., but I want you to talk about all the elements, including the color and the work of line and, um, and, and tell me what you think he's trying to express. And I want you also to tell me, so what is, how is Mook expressing something and, and what is he trying to express? That's what you're answering. And I want you to tell me what you feel when you see this. How does he make you feel? That was important to him. He wanted to make you feel a particular way. And I think most people have a pretty strong um, reaction to this. So I will leave this painting here and let you finish this one. I'm gonna show you a couple other paintings um, by Munch. This is a, a self-portrait um, of his family. This is also a portrait uh, that Munch made. This is a portrait of his sister, which is slightly disturbing, especially with this, this dark um, shadow behind her, knowing that she died of tuberculosis, it, it seems, um, clear that the shadow represents something ominous. Okay, now we're gonna move on uh, to our last, our last impressionist, uh, our last post-impressionist painter. And I'm gonna take us through to him. Ah, there it is. 
and that is Paul Cezanne. So Cezanne is, um, he's a painter, the, the work that we're looking at right now, which is the still life of the basket of apples was painted in 1890 to 94. We're getting to the very end of the, of the, um, of the century. And uh, Paul Cezanne with this work that we're gonna look at will take us over that, that century mark. Um, and so now we're moving, uh, we're moving really close to, um, to, to the 20th century. I will wait and introduce the 20th century on the next podcast or video cast. <laughs> um, so we're gonna go diving right into Paul, uh, Paul Cezanne. He was another French painter who was born into a wealthy family in Provence, uh, France, Southern France. He had a very difficult um, early career. His family did not want him to become an artist, but he persevered. Um, he loved the romantic and emotional work of Eugene Delacroix, Liberty Leading the People. Um, but even as a young artist, um, he had already absorbed the abstraction of paint um, uh, and the abstract style that was introduced by Manet, Monet, Ren and all the, on all these others, and, and realists and impressionists. Um, he, uh, he did make a very strong connection with a very uh, less popular impressionist painter named Camille Pizarro, who I didn't talk about. Um, and Pizarro would become a very Im important influence to him. Under Pizarro's guidance, um, Cezanne began to look to nature for both, for truth, and as well as, um, so truth, like truth outside and truth inside. So looking to nature to help him understand what is truth and how does a painter go about finding truth. Um, so I want you to take a look at this um, painting. And, um, and I'm gonna have you make a quick answer, you guys really know literally no, no, no more than two sentences. Um, how is this painting, how is Cezanne's painting different from um, either uh, uh, Van Gogh or um, um, Gauguin, the other two post-impressionist painters? Very different. How is it different? And you might say, oh, it's not that different. Look at it carefully. There's some ways it's really different. So let's, I'm gonna move us along right here. And I'm gonna take us up to this one. Um, this is a, a Mont saint Victoire. You can use this painting in your answer as well. How is it different? How is it different from the other two? Okay, short little answer. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's take a look at that. And we're gonna, I'm gonna try to help you walk you into why Cezanne is so important. And I'm gonna tell you right now that, that uh, Paul Cezanne is uh, probably the most important post-impressionist painter in terms of the painting movements that will come next. One of the things that Cezanne was trying to was trying to um, to get to agree was this idea of exterior truth and interior truth. So he's looking at this scene, and like you and I are both looking at this painting, he's looking at the scene of the mountain and the town and the tree. Right, this is Mont Saint Victoire in southern France where he lived, and he painted this thing I don't know twenty some odd times. Uh, and he painted it over and over to better understand this painting. And it wasn't that he couldn't get the mountain or the scene below, but he was trying to understand the act of seeing and the act of painting. And how do you reconcile what's out there with what's right here on the canvas? And one of the things you might notice, look at it carefully, that he doesn't differentiate much between sky and tree and mountain and foreground. Notice how he still, how he uses similar brushwork in all of these areas. You know, you and I know that the sky is way different from a mountain, right? You can't touch the air, but you can touch the mountain and you can totally touch the tree and you can totally touch the branches, but look at how they're all painted very, very similarly. He's treating them the same. Why? Don't answer that yet. That's what I want you to think about. Why is he treating them all the same? And how is he treating them? What's the painting style? Little patchworks, right? A little patch of paint here, a patch of paint there. See a little bit of tan here, a little bit of blue here, a little bit of purple there. Patches, 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 all patches. These very interesting patchwork of, of paint. What's he trying to communicate? Hmm. 
It's interesting. So here's some questions for you. Now, I just, I'm going to put them out there. I'm not going to answer them. You don't need to answer this on VoiceThread either. So you, so far, you're not having to answer too much on VoiceThread. Just a little bit about how his painting style differed. But I want you to, I want you to answer, just in your mind, think about this. Does he show us a sense of space? How does he do that? Right? Does it look like it's receding in space? I think you guys will agree it totally does. Right? How does he do that? Look at the warm, bright colors close up, brings it closer to us, gets cooler, grayer in the background, brings it back. Things get, they're bigger up front, the tree is bigger. As you go back, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, less detail. So he's obeying some of these laws of space, right? Which we know on a canvas is an illusion, right? Because does the canvas have space in it? No. It's flat, completely flat, right? Completely flat. So he's trying to reconcile this illusion of space, which is the way it looks out in front of him. He wants to show that with this non-illusional space in front of him, which is this flat canvas, and how he uses these little patches of paint to, to draw the viewer's attention to the fact that this is not a scene with distance. This is a flat canvas that's showing you an illusion of a scene of distance. Does that make sense? Let's look at his next, next painting and see if that makes more sense. Ah. So this one, uh, this one is the one on the AP. It's, the one, it's a little bit more abstract. Another one of uh, Mont saint um, uh painted in, in, um, in a, even a more exaggerated uh, patchwork kind of way. Would you agree? So, so here, so now you're, you've, I want you to, now I want you to take a look at this painting and tell me, and tell me why people call Cezanne the father of Cubism. And does this painting, is this painting true to the scene? That is the, the scene of the mountain or is it true to the canvas? And what's true about the canvas? And does it help us see the truth of the canvas? This is a hard question because the truth of the canvas is, is something we don't think about very much when we're looking at a painting. We don't think about what is true about a canvas. I know it's a hard question. Feel free to look at each other's answers, help each other. Is it true to the to the scene or is it true to the canvas? And what is the truth about the canvas that he's trying to express? And this is the whole thing about the picture plane that I'm that that makes him the father of uh, the father of cubism. Okay, so that's a lot of questions. I think that's five questions for this video. Um, that's the end of this video. I'm gonna um, take you through a couple. And one more of his very late, late paintings. This is the Grand Banu. This is the Great Bathers, um, which is uh, again, once again, using that real patchwork of colors. Uh, and his, he's starting to desaturate and not get as much, uh, use as much color in his later painting. Um, so, Father of Cubism. You have, a, you have some more cut out for you. All right, you guys, that's it for um, this time. I will stop the recording and um, we'll see you for the next one where we will talk about cubism. All right, bye.